Good afternoon, beloved. Good to see all of you here for our church school hour. So you have your Bibles, you should join me in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We are continuing with the theme in which we started a few weeks ago, and that is the purpose of our salvation was one, for the glory of God, two, for the glory of God, and then three, for our own good. He saved us with a definite purpose and that is that we would be like his son the Lord Jesus and that takes us back all the way to Genesis chapter 1 and God said let us make man in our image and after our likeness so I believe that it is possible although I am not the best example even in this era of the church which brings me much shame having had the word of God as long as I have I thank the Lord for the privilege of an education that would foster the stimulate my intelligence enough to comprehend this language that we were raised with and then to be able to study the scriptures. But I might as well be honest with you that my, my life work doesn't mirror what we have been teaching not only up on this platform on church, church school and for the worship hour but especially on Wednesday night God wants us to be like Christ uh, and he can't conceive of one reason as to why we can't so with that in mind and last week we had you to consider this thought that the renewing of our minds required the truth about our bodies and we have been working off of that uh, premise and we have gone to various scriptures so that you can see who and what our bodies are for we finished somewhere I believe in Luke chapter 21 and then we came back to 1st Corinthians because we had said that this is where we would pick up today in our lesson but Paul he admonished the believers there in Rome that I beseech ye therefore brethren by the mercies of God that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice holy acceptable unto God which is your reasonable service and be not conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of the mind and if you know your Old Testament well enough to find your way and track Israel when they were certainly following the Lord lockstep which was relatively rare you can see a comparison you can draw some conclusions from Israel and even now the church so this lesson uh, for the next few moments that are ours to share together we're going to consider that these things that we have been studying last week and 
we'll study today and then in the next hour, that they were written so that we would know. We would not make the same poor decisions in being led by the Spirit and having Christ as our head, which speaks of that cloud as he was in uh, the sky over Israel, that we would not fall for the, the same old flesh tricks. Nothing, I think, any worse than being deceived by our own selves. And we have a tendency to listen to what well, let me put it this way. I have the tendency to believe and listen to what Dennis has to say. And there have been more times than I care to mention to say that therein that has lied the problem. So here we work down through to verse uh, 5, but we want to read beginning in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant. How that all our fathers, speaking of the Israelites, were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They were with Moses and they were identified with Moses, but above them and certainly with them was the Lord. And did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ and we want to just remind you that as it was with them they had all things in common as it related to their deliverance so it is with us we have the same father if you're in Christ we had the same Savior and Lord and Master. We have the same Spirit. We are essentially eating from the same diet that they had, only in part from the law. But we have the whole canon of Scripture. So, God's program with Israel, if, if you fail to, one, see how he marvelously rescued them and delivered them. He rescued them out of Egypt. He delivered them out of bondage to bring them into the wilderness unto himself. Now, what should have happened in the wilderness is this. They should have been unshackled from a slave mentality. Remember, these folk had been enslaved as a people for over 400 years. It's easy to develop a slave-ish mentality especially when you have man serving or thinking in Pharaoh that he is a God in and of himself. So if, if we could have been transported back into the wilderness in the presence of the Lord and with a sea of humanity, with Moses there and Aaron there, spiritually speaking, we should have heard change that were on the move, but when they stopped, 
and they were where God wanted them. We should hear chains falling and hitting the ground where they might have an opportunity to see how wonderful it is to be free and to be free with the one who said, I am that I am. They weren't ready for two things. They weren't ready for worship, and nor were they as a people ready to serve. Because you cannot worship God if you really don't know him. You can't serve him because service becomes then an act of worship. So as uneventful and certainly the scenery of being out there in a place where it's the wilderness, that should have happened. And of course, you know the story. It didn't. It didn't. So he brought them out with a high hand to bring them in with no less than that so that they might be brought into a goodly place, a large place, lush, filled with all manner of good things, things that they hadn't even thought about while they were down there in Egyptian bondage. But that generation did not go in, and it was because of unbelief. Only two souls and the children that they were concerned about, their own children, and those that would be born to them within that period would go in. The Lord is the one who brought them out. He brought them out to bring them to himself. And that's the same reason for him saving you and me. He, he did not just save you so you could be in the church. Because, see, that would then overshadow him if, if, you, if you had that mentality. No, he saved us that we would be his in a relationship and in fellowship and communion that we could only have in his son by the spirit as we're guided by the holy scriptures so in all of his leading at some point that was known to the lord for a long time that he made it known to them that they would not reach the finish line he doesn't want that to happen in our walk as true believers because there is only one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. That, that's really only one spirit that is of God. That's only one body as it concerns the person of Christ. One God and Father who is before all, above all, through all, and in, as the scripture says, you all. Amen. So, they, they all, in verse 3, did eat the same spiritual meat. And they did all drink the same spiritual drink. And they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ, the same Christ who is present at this hour. I said something in a few messages that I want to kind of clean up this, at this hour. Is that I said that the church, the body of Christ, the habitation of God, the household of faith, is God's home away from his throne but I hope you all know that God is never going to get off of his throne where the throne gets cold because he's not there in that sense but it is the only place that he is welcome and that is the body of his son Jesus Christ who is the foundation 
He is the head and he is the all in all. And then the members tend to make up the superstructure that we know that is being erected before God. So God abides on earth in a temple. Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have. From this point it goes and says, but with many of them, God was not well pleased. And we, we know why. Uh, he was expecting them. It's, he was expecting to be well pleased, even though he knew the end of the story. He wasn't bringing them out. See, if you get this, man, this, this would be like worth so much to you. God did not save them to bring them out the way that they were and bring them into the promised land without that dealing with the shackles and repentance and getting right with God out there in the wilderness before they made that covenant. God was willing to make a covenant with them. And they should have just said, we ain't ready for that. A lot of us, we got our mind back in Egypt. So the last thing, and, and God was not going to do this, he was not going to bring his people out of Egyptian bondage and put them in the promised land. Because that would have been essentially the same thing as taking who? The Egyptians who were steeped in idolatry and all kinds of sin and bring them over into the promised land. That would have to be a reckoning that not only were they slaves, enslaved in Egypt, but they were slaves spiritually. And they needed a, a savior. They needed deliverance. Someone should have said, I, how can Moses just go about doing the thing that, things that he's doing, and I'm not like that, and I'm finding fault with him. I'm finding fault with the Lord. And they should have come to the place where with conviction and say, I want to I want to be like our leader because he, he's mirroring the I am. And mm -hmm. I think that that's what happened with, you know, Joshua, especially Joshua and Caleb. God wasn't well pleased because the one who was leading them out is the same one who's in the church right now, right here looking at me, reading my mail down in my spirit while I stand before you and reading the table of your heart, the tablet of your heart as well. Because he was and is God's well-pleasing son. And he was not going to settle for anything less than those people following the leadership, the cloud, Christ was in. The pillar of fire, he was with them. And his leadership through Moses. Now, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples. That should tell us everything about what we're capable of. When you hear talk of someone who has fallen, as we say, from grace, please don't say, I, I would never do that. We would hope that we could. And by the Spirit, we won't. But to say, and then find out that down the road somewhere that we're not quite as strong as we thought we were because the circumstances in which we were standing in when we heard the news about our sister or brother were more commodious for you know sunshine and you know birds and the butterflies. But when we get down the road a ways and the pressures of life and then that inward struggle, we may do something even more unheard of. Now it was written, verse six, that this is where this all of this hinges on this. Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things. As they also lusted. 
see if we can find our place in the Old Testament in Numbers. Numbers 10. Numbers chapter 10. Remember, this is written to us. And it is to admonish us, give us a word picture of how these folk actually displeased the Lord. To their own harm. Numbers, uh, let's begin in, in chapter 10 and verse uh, 33. Numbers 10. And this is where we'll see the account of where they lusted after evil things. We'll see them lusting. Verse 33. And they departed from the mount of the Lord three days' journey. And the ark of the covenant of the Lord went before them in the three days' journey to search out a resting place for them. And the cloud of the Lord was upon them by day when they went out of the camp. And it came to pass when the ark set forth that Moses said, Rise up. Lord, and let thine enemies be scattered, and let them that hate thee flee before thee. And when it rested, he said, Return, O Lord, unto the many thousands of Israel. We come to chapter 11. And when the people complained, study the scriptures always put yourself in the story to ask the question with everything that the Lord has done for us as a people bringing us out to bring us to himself that he might bring us into a good land would I have complained and then you can take yourself out of that equation and then just look into your own life since you've been saved and see how much complaining you and I may have, have done. I can't think of one reason. I hope this account helps me to see it the way that I believe the Spirit wants us to see it. That we have anything to complain about what God is doing as he's leading us from one degree of grace to the next. How he's going about that. Who he's using to do that. It would be one thing if, you know, if it was someone that didn't care about the soul and all they cared about was the you know, you know, sheep, kind of the vernacular, your, your fleece. But if you're in a situation where you know you're being led and guided in the truth, not that you're being led by man or men who are perfect, but you, I think you know that we want you to know the truth for yourself, where you can get into God's word and you can know him not only in salvation, but in this fellowship and communion where you and him can talk together and commune together without someone as a man or woman as an intermediary. But they found a way to complain. And, it, it, and when you look at it, you'll, you'll see just how silly it was. But then again, you may say, well, I don't know, maybe if I back out, you're looking at it the same way they were. But notice what happened. It displeased the Lord, which lets me know they didn't have anything to be complaining about. And the Lord heard it, and his anger was kindled. The 
His anger was tempered. And the Lord is going to judge his people. And it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. For our God is a consuming fire. And his anger was kindled, meaning it went from warming up. You got to imagine that. When, when, when he came down on we talked about him. I want, I want to turn there, but we don't have time. But you can read maybe uh, Exodus 24 is just another reference with him coming down upon the mount and fires everywhere. I mean, you think, I mean, that, this is his nature. He's, he's a consuming fire. I mean, Christ's eyes look like flame and fire. But then within his being, he was displeased, and that kindled and becoming warm and running hot. And the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed, now you notice the next three words in italics. It's not in the original, so we have to be careful when we run up on these. <coughs> and consumed in the uttermost parts of the camp from what is stated after this it doesn't give an indication that God destroyed anyone. But he lit that place up. And he lit it up, as it says here, in the uttermost parts of the camp. If you looked around, you'd see a blaze of fire all around Israel. Now, what are they going to do? Get scared? But as a people, they haven't repented. Let's go to Moses. Moses, you can come in now. We need you. And the people cried unto Moses, and when Moses prayed unto the Lord, the fire was quenched. And he called the name of the place Tabera because the fire of the Lord burnt among them. So, you know, usually when the Lord takes out a few folk, he, he will give you a number, right? <laughs> Isn't that how he usually does it? And so in this case, he didn't. This was more than a merciful warning. It was letting these people know that his anger that was in him, he placed it about them to remind them. It's only by his mercy that we are not all consumed. Amen. All right, then we come to verse 4. And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting, and the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? Now, the mixed multitude is spoken of over in Exodus 12, I think, uh, when they were being led out. And that word carries with it, like maybe ethnicity. This word mix doesn't, doesn't carry that. You can look it up. As a matter of fact, in Hebrew, it's 628. It, it means... Uh, It's, it's sinful, it's, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? It's, 
it's kind of like when folk are, are cohabitating, uh, sexual sins come, come to mind with that word. I mean, you'll see it if you look it up. So, you know, it, in the commentaries, it most agree that it's the mixed multitude that went out when they went out. They just kind of tagged along with them. Well, if that, even if that was the case, they would have died. Their children, if, you know, they had children, would have went in. And I can't rule out, but it's two different words. Mixed in the uh, Exodus account, it's spelled M-I-X. E, D, and this you see, it has M-I-X, T. Two different words. Two different Hebrew words. So I'm just calling your attention to that so that, you know, you, so that you know. Well, what happened with them is that they fell a lusting. And then, look like at the same time, and the children of Israel also wept again. I want to just deal with this matter of lust and maybe in the next few moments that we do have. We'll have to pick it up on the other side, maybe. Let's go over to 1 John. Because remember, these things are written that we would know. They're written as an example for us that we don't end up repeating the same things that God's people under tremendous leadership. I mean, who would be any greater than the one who was in the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night? Who would be any greater on earth than Moses? Moses is called the deliverer. So in 1 John chapter 2, in verse 15. So we're told, love not the world. The world in our text is God's created arrangement. This is as he created creation and everything within it unspotted from sin, anything that man could have contaminated. But it's more than that. Neither the things that are in the world and these would be the things that would rise to the system that the prince of the power of the air that he is over and those who have been contaminated by this germ known as sin. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. In this love, it speaks of preferring anything that God has created from our own selves to others, to things, or whatever is in this world. The love of the Father is not in him. Because God saved us on the premise of what? Love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So, so God did not put any one, any thing before his love for us to save us. And once we are saved, because you already know this, that not everyone's going to be saved. So the world will spread his love all the way to the end, and only a few will come to a saving knowledge of who Jesus Christ is. And then in that case, no one can separate us from the love of God. So we're being told not to love this world. The older you, well, I say old, the more mature you become in Christ, the less of an appetite you have for the things that not only did you like, but you loved that were in the world. Verse 16. 
Now, this explains what the world is. For all that is in the world, this is the world that's under the system that's spoken of in Ephesians chapter 2, where you have the living, well, I should soon say living, but you have the, those that think they're living and they are dead in trespasses and in sin, who are on the course of this world and they are under not only the command, but scrutiny of the prince of the power of the air. So for all of us in the world is the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Whoever loves the world is a worldly person. That's where their allegiance is. All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh. So what is lust? Lust is longing for something. Setting your heart on it. And don't really want to be restrained by anyone to get in the way of it. So that that thing can be carried out of whatever it is. My little definition of it is desiring right now what you cannot have and may never be able to have. Do you know the people who are miserable, who name the name of Christ, who are miserable? They are like these folk back over here in Numbers chapter 11. These people were miserable. Christ over their head. Moses had the word and lead them in a perfect way. The congregation was miserable. Why? They miss Egypt. And that's one of the ministries within the church is to call attention to that. So, if we come before you behaving worldly, saying anything that comes into our minds, walking in a way that's unbecoming, we wouldn't be a good example. And Moses was a good example before the people. Longing and desiring. This is of the flesh. Now, the Apostle Paul said, For though we Walk in the flesh. We do not war after the flesh. What does it mean? We live in the flesh. We live in a flesh and blood and bone body. We can't, we can't escape this. When it's time for us to leave, we'll leave. So when it comes to things like lust, and temptation to avoid sin, we have to be offensive minded. For Paul said, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not fleshly. Even though we see a fleshly body there is also a, a fleshly attitude. The, 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 we call it the Adamic nature that wants to run amok in our lives. That's rightly related to the Adam who fell. But also we're related to the one who rose from the dead, the last Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ. So the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are, so we so let you know that we're in a we're in a struggle, we're in a battle that is a battle that rages. 
but mighty through God. To the pulling down of strongholds. And most of us know nothing about that in the church. That verse of scripture is memorized. It's, it's in the Bible. Like someone told me it's in the Bible. But when things tend to be going in that direction, rather than pull down those strongholds, We tend to just let that thought mature. And the worst thing that can happen to a thought that has no business being thought is to speak it. Put wind behind it. Next thing you know, your foot will be in the path behind it. So the weapons of our warfare are not carnival, mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Casting down every imagination. And every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of Christ. Bringing every thought into. So, so this is what I've, I've heard it said, and, and I've also probably said it along the way that about our tongues. You know, we can't say what we haven't thought. <laughs> At least I hope we, we do give it some thought. It came out of a brain, right? We have to, that thought that you know is not right, cast it down. Cast it down. That's not of God. God did not give me that thought. It came from somewhere, but it didn't come from God. If it's not true, if it's not honest, if it's not pure, if it's not of good report, I cast it down. You, you said this. Child, and the more I thought about it, the mad I got. So casting down, so back up into the verse, I'm, I'm cited back with the verse. Let's just turn there. We're almost done. Let's go to uh, second, uh, second Corinthians chapter. 10. The second Corinthians chapter 10. And I want you to make a mental note with a day or at some point in time in your life when you actually exercise this verse. Verses 3 through 6. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, that's fleshly, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. So everything that opposes the knowledge of God, we're to do something with it. And if you don't do something with it, 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 got, it's, it, it has you. They'll find a nesting place. And, and bringing into captivity some thoughts to the obedience of Christ. Every thought. So before it gets to that thing that moves around in our this prison in here. Before we exercise anything to bring it out and let it come out through there or with our hands or with our feet, if it's not of God, cast it down. And he's expecting you to do it. He's not going to do it. Because this is what his son did. This is what the one in whom he was well pleasing with did. The Lord Jesus Christ. He was tempted just like all of us. Never gave it a, the time of day. So, we have to bring our thought life into conjunction with 
the knowledge concerning the, the will of God, but also obedience to Christ. Obedience to Christ. How many of you thought about being obedient to Christ this morning? Or yesterday? Or this week? How am I doing, Lord? What does what does my walk look like? Pastors were making a lot of, you know, you know, he's been preaching hard and and, and you know soaking wet at the end, and I'm glad he's not, you know, running on hot this morning because he's down here on the floor. I don't know if we could stand it. This is because I, I want to make sure you get it because now we're going to get it. Now's the time to get it, beloved. That we want to please God even in our thought life. Amen. And having it a readiness to punish. That's what that word, next word, to revenge or to punish all disobedience. But wait a minute. When your or our obedience is fulfilled. Second Timothy, um, Second Corinthians, I'm sorry. We're going to have to stop right there. We're running over. Okay, there you go. All right, let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we, we do thank you for uh, this excursion. You've taken us from glory into the story of your son, the Lord Jesus, as it concerns the nation, Israel, and uh, have shown us some things that we could have never never even thought about or even imagined. Uh, and there is such a comparison between the two. Uh, the visible church, what is called Christendom, which mirrors actually your people who fell in the wilderness and did not make it over into the promised land because of unbelief. Lord, I'm hoping and praying that all who under the sound of my voice and those who are watching now and those who will at the appointed time, that we would take these examples and see where we have missed the mark, incorporate your will in our lives so that we live in such a way that you'd be pleased not only just to save us, but that you'd be pleased to dwell in us and to be with us. So we give you praise in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.